you've got your Bibles this morning um, and you want to follow along, open, open up to Proverbs chapter 30, please. The reading this morning will be Proverbs chapter 30 and we'll read from verse 2 through to verse 9. The Bible says, Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the whole. Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell me? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And thou not unto his words, lest he repro- sorry, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found alive. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me the vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Thank you, Josh. Uh, We'll carry on our singing with number 279 in the garden. 279.
see you everyone this morning. Well, I believe the Lord would have us uh, just step away from our series that we've been working through for uh, another Sunday. Um, just had on my mind and my heart the week in front of us, the purpose for which we have a missions conference, uh, missions meetings, the, the task there, and uh, been asking the Lord that he might, uh, might help me to... It's the word. I know what I've been asking, I just don't know how to say it in one sentence. <laughs> that, uh, that the Lord might help me to convey what's on my heart and what the Lord's burdened me for and convey that to you as a congregation that we might step into this week and step into the task of missions uh, with one mind, with one accord, that we can enter into the week going, well, this is, this is what we're looking for as we step into these meetings, as we spend some time considering the task of missions. So go with me to the Gospel of Luke this morning. And verse 24, uh, sorry, chapter 24 will be our chapter, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and then find verse 44. Luke chapter 24, and then find verse 44. We'll take here the reading of the Great Commission. It is the commission that God's given us as a church. You know, when you, when you get looking at churches, and uh, you get looking at, uh, at church congregations, and you get looking at opportunities, and we can, there, there's, there's lots of things to be done. There's lots of things that can be done. Uh, I think often of uh, the circumstance with uh, Mary and Martha. And Martha was busy, she was a busy lady. She was so busy that God said she was cumbered about with much serving. She was serving so much, it was encumbering her. It was, it was cumbersome to her. It was actually getting in the way. She was so busy, she was so busy doing that she neglected that which was needful. And uh, she got so busy that, that she couldn't do what was actually needed to be done And in the circumstances there, it was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And can I say to you, your life can be so busy that you're cumbered about with much serving, you can be busy to the point where it's actually getting in the way of your spiritual walk. It's getting in the way of what God would have you do. Uh, if, If you're too busy to read your Bible, then you're too busy. If you're too busy to pray, then you're too busy. If, uh, if you're too busy for church, then you're too busy. And you need to change something. You need to make a decision that life's too hectic. You can't do what you need to do. And uh, you need to make some changes. You say, well, I don't, you don't, I don't understand this, the pressures on your life or the pressures on, in this situation or that situation. I fully agree. I probably don't understand. But if we can't find time for God in our life, then we're too busy. Because the purpose of your life is to find God and spend time with Him. That's what you were made for. You were made to be in fellowship with God. And so if we're too busy for the Lord, then it's a simple fact that we're too busy. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. We'll be up and standing for the reading of the Word of God this morning. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I tell you what, I've been rushing, my head has been rushing since I landed here this morning. Let's slow down and let's read this again and read it slowly. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. 
And he said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Uh, let's, let's pray this morning. Our Lord and King, we do thank you and praise you for all that you've done. I ask, Lord, you might help us. I pray as we consider this passage of Scripture and, and a number of others, that, Lord, you might work your purpose in our lives, that you might help us, you might minister to us, and that, Heavenly Father, we would be drawn into a closer walk with you. We give ourselves over to you this morning, Lord. We yield the time to you, and we pray that you would have free course amongst us, and your Spirit would, would minister to each and every heart that's here. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. In verse 44, the Lord says to his disciples here that these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He points back to the Old Testament and he said all the things in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, all of that Old Testament were written things that were concerning Christ, written things about Jesus. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with two disciples, and, and, and as he spake with them, their spirit did burn within them. They were, they were, they were impressed in their spirit at the very presence of Christ as he spoke with them. Jesus, with his disciples, he took time to show them through all the Old Testament the references in which it was speaking of him. The first one, perhaps, being Genesis 3.15, where, Jesus, where the Lord uh, spoke to, to Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he declared that the serpent would bruise his heel, but that he would bruise the serpent's head. Speaking of the, the wounding that the devil got against Christ, but the defeat that Christ has over the devil. And so there's all these Old Testament passages that speak either very plainly or through shadow and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here to his disciples, these are the words which I spake unto you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written. Verse 45 says that then he opened... Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. There is a, there's a key to unlocking the Scriptures. There's a key that you need to be able to open the Bible and understand what it is that God's saying. And the beautiful thing is, the precious thing is, the key that you need is not going to cost you anything. Even though it itself is priceless, it's free to you. The key that you need requires no labor on your part. You don't need to read the Bible more, even though that's a good thing. You don't need to be a better student of it, even though you should be. You don't need a university degree, and then finally... The scriptures will be unlocked to you. What you need is Jesus. And when you read the word of God, you need the spirit of Christ 
ministering the Word of God to you and opening your understanding to the Word of God. If you're reading the Bible, and I don't mean about when you read it this morning and it was just, it was just routine. I mean when, when you read the Bible and you absolutely get nothing out of it and it's been that case every time you read it, you need to read less and seek God more. What I mean by that is you need to stop aiming to read the whole book through and start sitting down and saying, Lord, show me what you mean from this passage of Scripture. Lord, I need something from you. I need you to minister to me. I need you to open up my understanding. If you're lost this morning and you don't know Christ, if you're not saved, if you're not a child of God, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And you need to spend time in the, under the preaching and exposed to the teaching of God's Word. But you don't need a better preacher. You need the Spirit of God ministering to your heart this morning. That's what you need. Here Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures that they would read the old testament and it just it just became clear to them i understand what he means now have you ever had someone say something to you and you say i don't understand and so then they say the exact same thing to you again and you go i don't understand and so they repeat the exact same words again and it's like, I, I can hear what you're saying, but I do not understand what you mean. Here, these weren't men that had never read it before. These were men that knew the Bible. They'd walked with Jesus for three years. It wasn't that they were ignorant in their head knowledge. They'd heard these things over and over and over again. But all of a sudden, Jesus opened their understanding. And they went, now I know what it means. I understand now. And for this morning, there's, there's many, many things here, but for this morning... I want you to pay attention to what he said after that. He opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus said to them, the Old Testament has been written and it's written to speak of the things of me. And then he opened up their understanding that they would understand the Scriptures. And as he said that to them, he then said to them, thus it is written about me. All these things were written about me so that your understanding might be opened as to who Jesus is and why he died for you. And all these things have written that you might understand who Jesus is and why he died for you, that you might then go and preach Jesus in the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the train of thought that is being followed through here. That the Old Testament is the thing that was written and the prophecies written that you might understand Christ, understand why He died for you, and understand what your responsibility is as a child of God to go on and preach the gospel. And He gives here the Great Commission. He states to them here that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations. You don't have to troll the internet for very long amongst uh, so-called conservative preachers, and you'll find someone that'll be telling you that repentance was just for Israel and repentance is not there for the church. 
that if you come across repentance, that then you're not saved because you've added works to your salvation. I tell you what, when I turned from me to put faith in Christ, that was not a work of salvation. That was a work of repentance from the filth of myself to laying hold of faith in Christ Jesus. It wasn't a work of salvation. Do you know what? My, my faith doesn't save me. All my faith does is give me access to Him who has saved me. If I had all faith and no Savior, if I had all repentance and no work of Christ, I wouldn't be saved. My faith is not my Savior. It's by faith that I lay hold of my Savior. And in laying hold of my Savior, I turn my back on my sin and laid hold of Jesus. Oh, how every day I have to now turn my back on my sin, don't you? Mortify the deeds of the flesh constantly. Continually needing to turn. Jesus said repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And He said this, And behold, I send the promise of My Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Jesus said to the disciples, He said, I am sending you to preach repentance and remission of sins. I've given you understanding of how the Gospel there throughout the Old Testament. I've given you understanding of the Scriptures. I've opened up your eyes. I've removed the scales. You have been born again. You're a child of God. And now I give you the task to go and preach the Gospel. Remit, repentance and remission of sins. But before you go, I want you to wait. Before you go, I want you to tarry and I want you to wait. And what he says to them, for them to wait for was this, I, I send the promise of my Father upon you, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Do you know what they had? They had faith, they had understanding, but they didn't have power. They had faith, they had understanding, but they didn't have power from on high. I tell you what, if we as a church are going to do anything, we need power from on high to do it. I believe Matthias was a good godly man. He died a martyr's death. There's no evidence to show anything other than that he was a good godly man that served God. But when he was appointed as an apostle to replace Judas, he was appointed when the church had no power of the Holy Spirit upon him. He was appointed when the church was supposed to be waiting. The church went ahead and did something before the Spirit of God was there to lead them in it. And so the Lord said, I want you to wait. Just as point of introduction, if you're familiar with Acts chapter 13, there was teachers at the city of Antioch. And there as they taught in the city of Antioch and they taught in the church, the Lord said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. Here's a church serving God together. And as they're serving God together, the Bible says they were fasting and they were spending time in God's Word. And the Spirit of God spoke to them and said, these two men, I want you to separate them for the work that I've called them to. And so they church, so they, they fasted, they prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent out Barnabas and Saul as missionaries to carry the gospel. And in Acts chapter 13, I think it's verse 4, it says, it says, having been sent forth there by the Holy Ghost. How is it that Barnabas and Paul were sent out to the work that God called them to? by the church following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Church, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. You need it in your life. You might find every Bible verse under the sun that will tell you the right sort of woman to marry. 
But boys, once you line up four or five women that fit, that fit the biblical description of what a godly wife should be, you're going to need the Spirit of God to tell you that one's for you. Because there ain't a Bible verse for that. You're going to need the leading of the Spirit of God. If you young men think that getting led by the Spirit of God is something you'll figure out later on in life, yet you're ready to make the biggest decision that will affect you for the rest of your life, something doesn't add up there. You better have the leading of the Holy Spirit of God according to the Word of God that you might make the right decisions in your life. And we as a church, we need the same. We need the Spirit of God at work in us. We have the Word of God. God gives us the understanding of His Word. But we also need the Spirit of God at work in our midst. Leading, guiding, sending. Go with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. Luke chapter 9. In verse 51, the Bible says that it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. This is speaking of Christ, so it's getting to the end of his ministry. We're getting to that point in time where he should be received up as the sacrifice for sin. That's what the cross of Calvary was all about. He's coming to the end of his earthly ministry where he was, uh, where he was preaching and teaching and working miracles and he's getting to the point of his ministry where he should be offered up as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And so that's what this passage is talking about. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so Jesus has decided that Jerusalem's where I'm going and you could see it written all over him that that's where he was going. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into villages of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Didn't have mobile phones, so they sent a runner. Go and book a motel and find a tape place for a, re- for a meal and set things in order. Jesus wasn't coming in with two or three people. He needed a reservation for 12 or more. He couldn't just land at some tiny village. And so he sent someone forward. And in verse 53, it says that they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. This village, they wouldn't receive him. You know why? Because they weren't the end goal. They were just the journey. They weren't, they weren't Jesus' end goal. They were just where he was passing through. And they went, Lord, if you're just passing through, I'm not interested. If you'll stop here, then we'll help you. But if you're just on your way to Jerusalem, we're not interested. That's an arrogant state, isn't it? To say to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, unless I'm more important to you, don't even bother. Whereas that woman with the issue of blood... She was one that said, if I just but touch the hem of his garment, he doesn't even need to know I'm there. If I can just get close enough to his presence, where I can brush his robe, that's all I want. What a different heart of faith. Here, they wouldn't wouldn't have him. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, They said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Every now and then you like them, boys, hey. (laughs) Every now and then it's like, so here's, here's Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's passing through. They're trying to set things in order. And that little village, whatever it was where they were going, they said, no, we don't want him. He's not doing what we want, so we don't want him. Well, isn't that what the world says today? 
Jesus isn't, what, isn't doing what we want, so we don't want him. The same world that denies God's existence shakes their fist in anger at him about the wickedness that goes on or the hardship around us and throws accusations about if, there's so, if God is such a good God, how does he allow such wicked things? What they, rarely, what they very rarely say is, if God is God, such a good God, how does he allow such a wicked person as me? The wickedness is always external, not internal, isn't it, in that accusation? And the answer is simple. Because he makes it rain on the just and on the unjust. He loves the wicked. And he's long-suffering to them not even willing that they should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why does God allow such wickedness? Because the only way to pull it up is by death. And he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He brings it about. And so this world throws accusation, they reject as, the, as we see here they did in, in Jesus' day. And his disciples, James and John, saw this and they got angry with the world around them. Look at how they treat Christ. Look at what they do to him. Look at how they speak of him. Look at how they do this. Look at how they do that. I tell you what, just Sodom and Gomorrah, that mob. Be done with them. Where's the brimstone again? Give me a Mount Carmel moment, Lord. And let you see you send fire down from heaven and just wipe out this crowd. Here's James and John, and they they are like, and you know what? They're even they're even anchoring it to the Bible. They're like, we're not stepping outside of scripture here. They said, let me give you chapter and verse, Jesus. Let's do this. You know what Jesus said to them? You know not what manner of spirit you're of. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Can I say to your church, you want to be careful. You'll, get, you'll, get so, you'll know the Bible so well that all you'll do is get angry at sin instead of feeling compassion for sinners. You'll just get to raging about the wickedness in the world and church we can get focused on changing the sin and stopping the sin instead of saving the sinner. I tell you what, political reform ain't going to save no sinner. Absolute abomination that there is laws in this country that allow abortion up to, up to partial birth. But changing them laws ain't going to save a single soul from hell. Those laws should change. That sin, that's an abomination. And if the Lord saw fit to strike down the legislator that brought it in, all well and good. That's in his providence to do as he pleases. But he said here to James and John when they said, look how they treat you, Lord. Look how they are against you. Strike them down. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Your heart's in the wrong spot. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. but to save them. There's not a sinner out there that Christ came to destroy. But rather, He came to save. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. John chapter 3 spells it out quite plainly. That they would come to the light. That's why Jesus came. 
He said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But then he turned around and said to the church, ye are the light of the world. In the last 2,000 years, we've got that wrong many, many times. There's not, there's not many denominations, there's not many long-standing denominations that don't have blood on their hands for burning heretics. Catholic Church is riddled in the blood of the saints. So is the Presbyterian Church. So is the Anglican Church. Turned and said, Lord, send fire down from heaven. And lost this heart. They knew not what spirit they were of. When you see the multitude, are you moved with compassion for them? When you see the lost, do you have the heart of Christ? The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Can I say to you, if Jesus' purpose at coming to this world was not to destroy, but to save, then likewise the purpose of the church, your purpose, my purpose, is not to destroy but to save. To seek and to save that which is lost. Have a look in verse 57. It came to pass that as he was in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Someone came along and said, well, you know what? I like that idea. And wherever you go, Jesus, I will follow I like that idea of seeking and saving that which is lost. I like that idea of not destroying, but saving. And Jesus, wherever you go, I will follow. And they make this statement. He comes to Jesus and says, and he says this, wherever I will follow thee, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And the illusion is drawn in this as we read on that he would follow Jesus everywhere to the saving of others so long as it didn't cost him too much. You'll follow me, Jesus says. You'll follow me to a life that has nowhere to rest your head. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests and you'll follow me. As I walk from town to town as a pilgrim on this, le- on this earth, with nowhere to call my own, with nowhere that is my place. Do you remember the context? What had just happened? He literally had nowhere to lay his head. He just sent his disciples forward, go prepare a place. And the place said, we don't want you. And up pops a young man and says, wherever you go, Lord, I'll follow. And Jesus said, you'll follow me? You'll follow me to absolutely nowhere to even lay my, re- lay my head down at rest? That's what you'll do? Let me ask you, will you? Will you follow Jesus as he seeks and saves that which is lost? Will you follow the King of Kings to the point where they're it, there is nowhere for you. What cost is too great? See, where we started, the disciples had the wrong heart. And they'd already proven that they were willing to follow him at the cost of everything. They would co- it, they'd already walked away. They'd left their nets. They'd left their tasks. And they'd separated their lives to follow Jesus. But man, they wanted to see some fire rain down from heaven and some righteous judgment of God instead of this heart of compassion for those that constantly reject, 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 reject. But this second lot we come to, 
They would follow Jesus so long as with conditions. You see it plainly in the next two. He said unto another, follow me. And he he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. The first, it might mean a life where it would cost him his securities. The next, it was his family. Pastor Al preached on this many, many years ago. You know, you just remember some sermons. I mean, how many sermons do you hear throughout your life? But every now and then, you know, one or two will just stick, right? Um, And I remember him preaching on this and he said, you know, we assume he was dead, but the Bible doesn't actually say it. Let me bury my father. I tell you what, when I don't have to look after my dad, when my earthly responsibilities are met, then I'll follow you, Jesus. When I've taken care of what I need to take care of, then I'll follow you. Well, so long as, so long as you take care of me, I'll follow you. Or once I've taken care of me, then I'll follow you. These responsibilities, that responsibility. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. He said, he said, he said, let the dead take care of the dead. You have an issue of eternal life. Let those that are earthly minded take care of the earthly minded. You go and preach the kingdom of God. He said, I, he said to someone, follow me. And they said, I would, but there's something in the way. Another also said in verse 61, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. Let me just do it in a friendly way. Let me do this one thing first. If it be true that the second gentleman's father wasn't dead, then that was an unknown period of time, right? Here's this one. It's like just this one soft thing. It won't take me long. I'll go and say farewell and then I'm with you. Jesus said, Jesus said, I whistled my dog last night. She's laid out on my lounge room floor because I'm getting soft. She's laid out on my lounge room floor and it's cold outside and she's sound asleep. I walk to the back door and I whistle. It was a better whistle than that. She lifted up her lazy head and looked at me. Nothing else moved. I said, oi. I tell you what, you couldn't, it, it, body language of a dog. <sighs> You'd have thought she was on death's door, walking out that back door. You know what she was saying? Just let me lay here for a little longer first. She knows she's got to go out. She might have vain hopes from sleeping on the, for sleeping on the couch, but it ain't happening. I've said that sentence before. That was about a dog being inside. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't asking for much. But I looked at her and, and, and I'm sure the Lord was talking to me through that dog. I looked at her and I went, how often do I do that to God? He whistles. And I roll my eyes and go, really? Right now? Here's this one that Jesus said, this one, they volunteered. I'll follow thee on this condition. I'll follow you if you let me do this first. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back, desiring what is left. No man laying his hand to the plough and looking back, 
befriending what is what he's left is fit for the kingdom of God. All these examples, the wrong spirit, these last three, you know what it is? They had they had priorities. They were just prioritizing things. They were just there were things that were more important to them. Well, I would do this, but this is just a bit more important. I would do this, but this is just a bit more important. Let me do this first because it's a higher priority than that. Chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed, now catch this word, other 70 also. After these things, the Lord appointed others. Not those. Others. And sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, this is what he said to the others. He he appointed others. If you... If you put things in front of God, He will achieve His purpose. You do understand, Christ is coming back. The fullness of the Gentiles is coming in. There is a harvest that God's in the business of bringing in, and whether you're laboring in the field or not, God's going to bring in that harvest. But if you say, Lord, I would, but after this. Lord, I would if you do that. Oh, Lord, I would on this condition. Lord, I have a priority that is not your priority. And if you make my priority one of your priorities, then I'll do it. If that's your Christian life, then the Lord is going to appoint others. Not you. The Lord's going to use others, not you. If your Christian life is full of, Lord, when I've done this, or or, Lord, when I've done that, or Lord, Lord, if if I know that I'll have this, then then I will. All All these priorities. And those priorities are going to get in the way of you serving God. And so Jesus appointed others also. And so now he's got 70 men gathered together. Or 70 people here. And he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. And he gives them their first task. Here's the 70 that he's sending out. The 70 that are willing to go. The 70 that didn't bring any excuse. The 70 that just said, we will, what do you want me to do, Lord? Here am I, send me. He said, the harvest truly is, is great, but the labor is a few. Here's your first task. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. First thing, if you're going to go, is you need to be willing to pray. First task, if you're going to go, is you need to pray. Now, church, we have a great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Let me tell you what we're doing well. As your pastor, let me just give some observation. As a congregation, you do very well at sharing the gospel with Jerusalem. The mo- when, when people come to the Lord and the Lord uses our congregation, and that, generally speaking, it's through that one-on-one witness of you to your neighbor, you to your workmate, you to your family member, and that's right and good and it's what we should be doing. And, and, and the Lord uses that. And we hand out a few gospel tracts once a month and we get some gospel invites out. And across the seven continents, amongst the how many hundreds of countries, amongst the how many millions or billions of people in this world, We financially support four missionaries for $150 a month each.
and it's been, it hasn't been since the 90s that someone from our congregation put their hand up and said, we'll go to the mission field. And in the 30 years, 35 years of our church's history, by my count, I think there's four men that have said, Lord, we'll submit to the, we'll go, we'll, we'll go and preach. We'll go and preach the gospel. Here's, here's my whole point. What's, 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 what's this morning about? What's a missions conference about? Why put a week aside to look at missions? Because church, that's what we're here for. We're here to get the gospel out. People are dying and going to hell. And I understand this world's wicked. It's got, it's got wicked laws. It's got wicked habits. It's got wicked mindsets. But we're not here for judgment. We're here for the gospel. Your task is... I understand, I understand you have a responsibility here as a parent. But your task isn't to take your children and shelter them away from the effects of the world so that they will love God and go to heaven. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to shelter your children. It's to, it's to feed them. It's to protect them. It's to raise them up and nurture them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord that they might love God so that then they can go and tell everyone else about God. And the only reason they're going to go and tell everybody else about God is because you've raised them up in an environment or God's dealt with them afterwards outside of, after He's got them out of the environment you put them in where they've seen, hey, there's a world that's going to hell and it's our task to get the gospel to them. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. That is supposed to be the present practice of the church, is going. And a missions conference, what are we looking to do? We're looking to put down all our excuses. We're looking to put down all the things that we prioritize above it. And we're looking to pray. And sit before the Lord. And say, Lord, here am I. What would you have me to do? Why take Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Why take a Wednesday night and then have preaching on Thursday, Friday and Saturday and then all again on Sunday on this thing of missions so that we can fill our calendar? No, so that we can place ourselves prayerfully and deliberately before God and say, Lord, there's a task for me to do. What part do you want me to play? What would you have me do? You won't find a missions conference in the Bible. I could probably preach this as the first missions conference. That would probably that'd be, that'd be a cute little thing to do, how Jesus got his 70 and he preached his first missions conference to his 70 before he sent them out. And we could do that. I could take you to the Old Testament. We could look at all the feasts and how many there were. And you know, there's eight feasts throughout the Old Testament. There's three major ones where they'd put a week aside to just be dedicated to the Lord for a week. We could look at all them things. But at the end of the day, here's what I'm asking of you. Can you pray this week? Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers. Pray that the Lord would speak to our hearts and send us to the work that he'd have us do. Maybe it's supporting support missions. Maybe it's going yourself to the mission field. Maybe it's being a, a better witness where you are in your own life. Maybe... Maybe it's submitting to the missions 
that has been put into your life. Maybe you're, not, maybe you're at a place where you just need to go, Lord, I've been, I've been kicking against you for a long time and you've been sending missionaries through my family, through my church, through my workmates. But can I ask you this? As you come into this week, can I ask you, when you get to Thursday, when you get to Wednesday night, and you go, will I go to church tonight, or won't I? Can I ask you to make it a high priority? I don't know what your circumstances are. Maybe you can't. But can I get you to look at it and not look at it as a night at church, but can I get you to look at it as God might have something for us as a congregation on, on this thing of missions. And it'll cost me some money to go, but I'm going to make that investment. Or it'll cost me some sleep to go, but I've gone to work tired. Before. Have you ever gone to work tired before? Have you ever gotten up for work and gone, man, I should have gone to bed earlier? but I binged something too long or I stayed out too late or I sat up too, lo too long. And can I say to you that the work of God is worth going to work tired for? You say, well, you know, I'd go, but it's going to mess up my child's sleep routine. Can I ask you, mess up their sleep routine this week? They will not die. They'll be fine. Drag them to church. That's healthy. <laughs> you know what that kid's learning? That kid's learning that you know what God's worth it. And dad, it, it was God was important enough to Dad for him to fight for me to behave in church. And then, despite the embarrassment, he brought me back next week. And it's embarrassing. Abigail's embarrassed me plenty of times when she was little. Bethy never has, have you, Beth? <laughs> Can I ask you on Friday night to go, Lord, if there's something else you want me doing tonight, if I have another responsibility that is your priority, help me not to neglect that. But Lord, if missions is your priority. Help me to be faithful to it tonight. Let me get that. We've got men come and they're going to preach whether you're here or not. There's a great commission. There's souls to be saved. Missionaries are going to go whether you go or not. Where the shining light plays its part in the great commission of having repentance and remission of sins preached amongst the whole world. Whether we do our part or not, the job's still going to get done. but the Lord might have a part for you to play. And if you're just making excuses, if your heart's just wrong in the wrong spot, then the Lord will send others. And the, labor is, the, the work is great and the labor is a few. Can I ask you to pray this week that the Lord might send us? That He might endue us with power from on high in that sense that his spirit might work in your heart and mine that we might go out into all the world and preach the gospel I'm going to close with a hymn I'm going to spring it on Ron I don't know if you can play it bringing in the sheaves where is she gone she's out the back hiding well we'll sing it without the music bringing in the sheaves <laughs>